we will be continuing in our study of Genesis this morning. If you want to go ahead and find uh, that passage in your Bible, Genesis 25, verse 19. And if you do not have a copy of Scripture with you, there should be one in the pew near you. And feel free to grab that. That should be about page 18 or 19 there, Genesis 25, beginning with verse 19 this morning. We will read that and go through that passage in just a moment. I think most of us are familiar with, in our culture, and our time, for for many years now, and really since the dawn of man, but especially in our culture today, and at least in modern times in the 20th, 21st century, with the idea of the next big thing. We, We live our life, so many people this morning are living their life waiting for the next, whether it be a holiday or the next big event, or the next big splash in their life. Many are watching the TV, or the internet, or their phones, or whatever, to see what somebody else tells them is the next big thing. They might not even know it's a big thing unless somebody tells them. And that has become our culture for many, many years now, and much is much the case now, and is can be very enticing to draw us all in. And even the church, in many respects, has adopted that in thinking that we've got to have a big thing. There's got to be a big thing every week. And many pastors have fallen out of the ministry, have have succumbed to temptation, or have taken themselves out of the ministry because of the internal pressure that they put on themselves to create something bigger, to create something better. This next week, better than last week so that more people will come. And so it goes not just in the secular world, it's in the church world. But this next big thing, that that living our life from one while to the next, is a big deal. And and if you you look at our calendar, if you have your calendar on your phone or some kind of electronic device, and it, of course, is attached to something where that data goes and comes from, but the holidays that are on that calendar are amazing. You literally could go all year and not work if you took every holiday. And it is, that is because we are creatures of wanting something big. We, 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 we have to have an event. And the reality is life is not that way. The day in, the day out grind of life is not that way. Many of you have are looking in your rearview mirror at your work, your professional, your career, and you have retired, and you're not in quite as much of the daily grind, but you can tell younger people that it is. It is a daily grind, not necessarily in a negative way, but it is going to be day in, day out, getting up, going to work, coming home, dealing with those problems, getting something to eat, going to bed, and get up the next day and do it all again for the next 35 to 40 minutes. That's the reality of the human life. That is the reality of the human life. But we don't want to tell anybody. I can remember, I knew that. I was told that. I was raised by the greatest generation, the World War II vet. I was told that at a very young age, that's what life was. But I can remember being 22 years old in this very community, about this very time of year, and had been just a couple of weeks into work and getting up and thinking, oh my God, I've got to do this forever, pretty much. And that was a, that's a rude awakening to somebody who has been in college the last four years. And that's back when college was really college and it really wasn't a vacation, not in a safe place. But excuse me, I digress. But when we, when we realize that reality that life is a grind, that life is a grind. There are ordinary things that have to take place. And folks, I'm here to tell you this morning from God's Word that the Christian life is a grind. Now we can enjoy sweet, sweet, dear fellowship with our Lord. That's why we come this morning. We come to enjoy that fellowship together and worship Him. And if we're believers, we should should feel that. We should know that. We should long for that. Remember last March when we were shut down and couldn't meet for a few months and we talked about and we prayed for, boy, I cannot wait till we come back and there'll be a new desire 
Well, for many, there's not a new desire. The old desire will be gone because they may not have really even had a desire at all. But for those of us who know the Lord, who are in relationship with Him, there should be a desire to meet with His people. There should be a desire to meet together. And yet, even in the the grind of the spiritual life, there's sweet fellowship. But understand that when you were saved, for, for many people, not the thief on the cross, who died just in an hour or so, a couple of hours maybe, after he was saved, but for most of us, not everybody, but for most, the majority of mankind that God saves, we live a number of years, some many decades, where we are in that grind in a sinful world. And we're an alien to that world. And the world is different from us. And that makes it hard. And God, you do understand that when He saves you, He could immediately glorify you. And, and you would, you, we all would be perfectly perfect then. But God doesn't choose to do it that way. How do I know that? Because I can read Scripture. And that has been the history of the world. So what, we want to, what we're going to see in this passage today, in Genesis 25, the, kind of the middle portion, Genesis 25, 19 through 28, we're, we're going to, to see the ordinary, what, is, what theologians sometimes call the ordinary means of grace. How God works. God can, God can perform a miracle. He could take all of us to glory right now. But He doesn't choose to do that. He chooses to teach us. He chooses to teach us to rely on Him, to trust Him, to grow our faith, and believe Him rather than the world. To believe Him rather than, than Satan, than the enemy. And so there's an ordinary meaning, and that ordinary means is His Word and prayer and how that works through the ordinances in the church. Not that the Lord's Supper or baptism saves you, but how His Word is exalted in that. How we are exalted in prayer, in, in word, when we read the Word, when we hear the Word, when we preach the Word, when we listen to the preached Word, that we, is, hopefully God is glorified, but we are or spurred on by that. That is the ordinary means of grace. That's what that's talking about. Not some next big thing, not a big wow, but God tells us. He tells us how to worship Him with the Word and the Spirit, with Word and prayer, and, 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 and using that in music, using that in the ordinances, using that in giving. That's how we worship God. He tells us that. So those are the ordinary means, and we see that in chapter 25 here today with the birth of Esau and Jacob. Many of you know this story or are familiar with it, but hopefully God will, will teach us a greater depth today about what He is. And what we're going to specifically see is how God chooses His people, how He chooses His children. And then the imperfection of those that are chosen and how that exalts God even more. Some of you are looking puzzled at it, and that's okay. But let's go to the Scripture. And hopefully you'll see what God has gloriously shown me this week and the great deep truths that he, he gives us through this history that He unveils here in the book of Genesis. Genesis 25, verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, the pair of Pateran, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. 
that first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so that they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Let's go to God in prayer as we begin to hear his, his word and the intent of his message this morning. Lord Jesus, we come and we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have preserved your word. We thank you for already what we have been able to rejoice in and worship this morning, God, the truths that you have made apparent, the truths that we have sung about, the truths that we have read about and been able to pray about, God, of your great forgiveness, your great love of our confession and being honest with you. And Lord, we come now to a time where we read this text. And Lord, I pray that, that all of us will know that, that this is your word, God, that we won't have to be warned like the children of Israel and Amos, that there's a famine coming because we have not loved your word, because we've taken it for granted. I pray, God, that we will hold fast to this that you will open our ears, God, open our hearts and minds to the truth of what you have given your servant Moses to write down in, in, this, in this text and how it applies to us today, God, that we might be exalted, God. And we pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Again, we want to look at this this narrative, this story of Rebecca having her children, and how that applies to us today, and how it applies to the church universal, not just today, but for in all time. And there, there are deep truths here, and we, again, the great benefit of preaching through a book is that you can't skip these. That you can't, you say, why do you want to skip the birth of a child? Well, because of what it, it, it leads to because of how it's cited in other parts of God's scripture in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And sometimes it gets complicated so people choose to, to skirt over it and not think about it. What I challenge you this morning, my brothers and sisters, is to, to dig into God's word, not just this passage, but all passages. And I have to remind myself this because sometimes God's word is hard to understand for us as, as mere mortals. But with the Holy Spirit residing in us and through prayer, the ordinary means of grace, as we see here, God will show us His truth. And just because it may be hard to, to accept because it's not what I think, I ask you to continue to struggle with it and not shut God's Word and do without it so that you don't have a famine in your own life and it's void of God's Word. So with that preface, we go into this passage and see that we've seen Abraham die last week. He's been buried there with Sarah and the, at the plot he purchased. And now the next 10 or 11 chapters will be about Isaac and his family, his heirs. The child of the promise, remember. That's who God is going to make the promise come through. Land seeding blessing through Isaac. And so we see his birth here and now we see that he, at the generations of Isaac, he's a grown man, and he's taken his wife. We studied this a couple of weeks ago when David was here, and how he secured Rebekah, how Abraham secured Rebekah for him, and that was the wife that God had for him, so now they're married. But she is barren, just like Sarah was. Amazing how God, that, that grind, that, that facing challenge, that facing hardship. And we see right here the, the prayer life of Isaac. We know that he's 40 years old when he gets married. When she finally gives birth, he's 60. For 20 years, he prayed. Now, we don't have a daily journal of his prayer journal. He didn't post it on Facebook. He didn't take a video of himself praying and show it to everybody. 
so everybody would be awed by that. But we know that for 20 years, he prayed in a consistent, persistent fashion because his life was barren. Now, let's not be oblivious to the truth. Isaac was Abraham's son. Remember, this is the one Abraham took up and put wood on his back and strapped him on an altar and had the knife out and the flint out ready to set him to fire and sacrifice him. This is the same man. So he knows about the promise. Trust me. He knows that he is the child of the promise. And yet, here he has secured a wife who is barren in 20 years, 19 years into marriage, there's nothing. We've heard this story before, have we not? It was 25 years after God promised Abraham that Sarah gave birth. And this just this is the means by which God operates, folks. Could God have made Rebecca pregnant on her wedding night, even though she was barren? Absolutely. So you mean, okay, Pastor Isaac then, Isaac caused her to be pregnant. Really, that, that pregnancy, that life was not a gift of God. No, incorrect. It was a gift of God. But God used Isaac's prayers. Because what happens when we pray, folks, when we have deep prayer, when we have deep prayer, we grow our relationship. You know yourself, any relationship you have with a spouse, with a friend, with a child, with a niece or a nephew, a grandchild, any time you spend time in conversation, that relationship grows. That, that relationship grows, especially conversations about hard things. And sometimes it doesn't go well when you're talking about those hard things. But when you persist, when you keep going over a period of weeks, months, and years, God blesses that. And you, you deepen that relationship. That what, that's what happens when we pray. Gary Miller, uh, a British theologian and really an expert on prayer in, in one of his books, Calling on the Name of the Lord of Biblical Theology of Prayer, says, gives a simple definition for prayer. Calling on God to come through on His promise. Because God has given us promise. If you're His child this morning, God has promised certain things to His children. There's certain general promises that He's given. Isaac knew that he was the child of the promise. It doesn't necessarily say that, but understanding the context of what we read in the previous 24 chapters, I believe Isaac knew this. And so he is calling on God to make good on his promise. He's being persistent in prayer. Calvin said this, what we can learn about that. And as Isaac teaches us by his example, to persevere in prayer. So God also shows that he never turns a deaf ear to the wishes of his faithful people, although he may long defer the answer. You hear that? He will not deny the prayer of the faithful and the faithful prayers in accordance with His will. But He may defer that answer for a long time. Some of you are sitting here this morning that have been praying for somebody or something for a number of years and it hasn't happened. You have a child or you have a grandchild or a loved one or maybe a spouse or somebody that you care deeply about that you know is still in rebellion at that point. They're not saved and you struggle with that. We all face that. But what you if you say that God is sovereign in this world and that He is the creator and He's the creator of every life and that He is sovereign over salvation, you must trust God. And God, for whatever reason, because we certainly aren't God, is teaching you something through this time of prayer. That you need to be persistent. That you need to be consistent. That you need to be faithful and that you need to know God better. To cry out to Him. There's nothing wrong with telling God how you feel. There's a respectful way to do that. There's nothing wrong as we see Rebecca do. She questions God. Why is this happening? She's barren, and then she gets pregnant, and then she feels this struggle going on. And it, she didn't have an ultrasound. She hadn't seen the, the 4D, 5D, 10D image that we can see now on ultrasound, she just knows that she's pregnant 
and there's something going on that doesn't feel right. And she went to inquire of God. That's a great thing to do, folks. When you don't understand what God is revealing, go and inquire of God. Ask Him. God, teach me. Show me. And we see that God gives that answer, does He not? Verse 23, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Not two little infants, or two little babies, or two fetuses, or two fetal masses, or whatever term that's given. But two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Well, folks, that was a landmark saying that God gave there, what the, the instruction gave, because the, the custom, not just for the Jewish people and the Hebrew nation, but really for the whole world at that time and for many centuries to go, was primogeniture where the first, the oldest inherited everything. They got everything. They, they were the one. We saw that with Abraham and Isaac, did we not? Isaac sent away all the children of his concubine. He sent away Ishmael. He sent them away with some cash. Or as my four-year-old grandson likes to say, some bucks. He sent them away with it. But the blessing went to who? Isaac, the child of the promise. We talked about that last week. How Abraham finally understood and trusted God. And there was a distinguishing, not a, not. Not partial treatment, but a distinguishing according to God's law there. So when he tells Rebecca that the older will serve the younger, there's going to be two nations that are divided, that are parted in your womb. That is a big deal. And that is the answer that God gives her. And folks, this brings us because, not just because of what's said here. Remember, we don't read Scripture in a vacuum. We have the whole revelation of God. And I hope you've noticed, but as we've gone through Genesis each week, we always refer to other passages, sometimes in the Old, sometimes in the New, many times in the New, where things are mentioned that where these passages are mentioned by the apostles and the writer of the New Testament. That's important. Not all, not all of the Old Covenant is mentioned in the New Covenant. doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means some passages care, carry greater value in what God wants to teach us. And He's teaching us something here. And it's a hard doctrine. It's how God chooses His people. It's the doctrine of election. Sometimes when you say that word, people go up and on. They think it's a bad word. Now, if you're thinking about November every four years in the United States, I understand that. But in God's word, when He uses the term election, it, is, it ought to be music to our ears. It's one of the sweetest, most humbling doctrines. And it's a biblical doctrine. It's a doctrine that many people have misunderstood and mistaught and all those things because that's what man does. But it is a beautiful doctrine, and this is what he refers to here. And we see in, in this passage in 20, 25, 23, because it's quoted again in Romans 9. In Romans 9, verses 10 through 13. Remember, this is where Paul talks about uh, where Isaac is a child of promise and not all of Israel is Israel. Just because you're a Hebrew doesn't mean you're God's child. It is a spiritual birthright, if you will, that we'll be looking at next week. But it is a spiritual birth that he's talking about. And that those are the people. So in Romans 9, 10 through 13, just jot that down on your note sheet. And not only so, meaning he's just talked about Isaac being the child of the promise. But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Verse 12, she was told, we just read it, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate. Now, who's Paul quoting there? That's not in Genesis. That's Malachi, the prophet Malachi. Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. Now, what Malachi is addressing, if you write that down and go back and research it later, Malachi is addressing the children of Israel, and they say, how has God loved us? We've gone into exile. We've been punished. How has God loved us? 
And Malachi says, For Jacob I've loved and Esau I hated before they were ever born. Now that sounds like a difficult thing that God would decide before somebody's birth that he's going to love one and hate the other. The hate there, many have said it's a different levels of love. I won't go that far. But it's not so much an animosity as it is a punishment. And we must understand, folks, this is why salvation is so important, to understand that it is not walking down the aisle or phrasing a certain prayer correctly or signing a covenant or checking a box. It is a work of God because what do we all deserve? Let's remind ourselves of this. What do we deserve? We deserve eternity in hell because we are sinners. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. I didn't come up with this rule. If, I, if it was left up to me, we all would go to heaven. We'd be having a party right now. But I'm not God. And my ways are not His ways. And my thoughts are not His thoughts. But what we see in this is God's great mercy. That in this case, Jacob, who is the child of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that he singles Jacob out. And before he's ever been born, he says, I'm going to show my great love and mercy to him. And I'm going to have a people all over the world throughout the history of time, ever how long that is before God comes back to take us home. From every tribe, every nation, every people, every language, that will be mine. My treasured possession. And I'm going to secure that. Not because of anything they do. And you say, wait, I just don't like that that terminology. Well, you need to get over that term, that that not like because it's biblical terminology. Throughout throughout Scripture, Paul says it in Romans. Paul says it in Ephesians. Peter talks about it in his letter. He refers to the children of God as who the elect. That's who we're called, elect exiles. That's who he addresses his his letter to. And that just means, just like saints, it's another word for Christian, for follower of Christ. The Baptist faith and message, our statement of faith, let me remind you, if you're a member of Green Pond Baptist Church, this is our statement of faith. 2000, Article 5, and it is labeled God's purpose of grace. Refers back to Romans 9. Election is the gracious purpose of God according to which He regenerates, justifies, sanctifies and glorifies sinners. It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with that end. That, I love the way that is phrased. Adrian Rogers did an excellent job as he chaired that committee in 2000 that wrote that. Because he covers salvation perfectly. Regeneration? We're regenerated before anything happens. Why? Because we're dead in our sins and trespasses, folks. It, I told you last week, I've told you the last couple of weeks, your salvation is something to rejoice in. If you say, well, I got saved back in October 29th. You need a shot of more than a vaccine if that's how you treat your salvation. Because it has been a miraculous, not a daily grind, but a miraculous instantaneous work of God when He regenerates you and just justifies you and declares you right with Him and forgives you of all your sins. And then He goes about, as this says, sanctifying you. And then in the end we are glorified when we leave this earth. And we become really like Christ in heaven. What a glorious truth, folks. What a glorious truth. Here's the problem with tough biblical doctrine. I was talking about somebody this week about this, about Sunday school and what's happened over the years. And I, I love the Living Bible and the paraphrase, the Good News translation and all those because that helps us when we study hard things and, and awkward wording that we're reading in the original text and it, it helps us get it down on a level. But what it has done, along with our whole culture now, it has taken biblical language and thrown it out. And we like to say, hey, the man upstairs, my buddy upstairs. Well, let me tell you something. That borders on being irreverent and sacrilegious. 
because God Almighty who created this earth and is holy, righteous, and just, and merciful, and the whole nine yards and all His glory is not a man upstairs. He is the Almighty God. And so that all that, that lingo that helps us understand, we still need to refer to God in a biblical way. And the biblical, that's what's happened with so many biblical gospels. We have removed them from our vocabulary, and therefore when somebody mentions them, we go, oh, oh I, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't believe that. What is that? Well, it's in the Bible. It is in the original language of the Bible. And we need to know that, folks. We need to, we need to revere God's holy word. We need to understand the importance of it. Here's the, I don't for a moment, because here's, you have the doctrine of election, and you have the doctrine of, of man's responsibility. Does man have a personal responsibility? You better believe it. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility of how I live my life. That's how we have, that's why we have a moment of confession here every week. That's why you hopefully have that in your daily life every day. Because we are responsible to a holy, righteous God. And I don't pretend to understand where God's sovereignty and man's responsibility perfectly intersect. I have no idea. But I trust the scriptures. And I trust what it says and what it teaches. There's basically three views of God, or there's three views of the Christian faith, really either one. You have one of the lost person, the one who's in rebellion, who doesn't know God, and even though they might read God's word, and even though they might think because they joined a church one time that they are a child of God, but they do not know God and they do not understand. And then you have the view of the elect, God's children, those that have been saved and those that will be saved. And there's a big, wide parameter there because none of us are perfect. And as many theologians have said, we're all going to have our theology corrected when we get to heaven, when we are glorified. And then there's God's view of God, the biblical view that is completely right and completely just. And folks, I've told you this many times, and I hope you hear this this morning. The fact that God and His Word is complex and deep and makes you question, say, I'm not sure I understand that, that is a comforting thought. Because if God, in all His supremacy, in all His sovereignty, if you and I can understand everything about him in this fallen state that we're in, then I don't need you. I can go to Clemson or Columbia on Saturday afternoon in the fall and worship them. I don't need a God that I completely understand. I want my God to be smarter than me. I want there to be a deepness and a vastness and a well, an unsearchable well of goodness and love and mercy and grace that I can't completely grasp in this life. I can grasp a lot more than I have. And Lord willing, I will. But I don't want it to be finite because He's an infinite God. And what a great comfort that is to me. And I hope it is to you. When you see this, these imperfections that, that Moses mentions here in the last of this, of Jacob and Esau's birth. Just real quickly, two things. One, Esau comes out red in the, in the name Esau. That's what it means. We're going to see that even more prolifically next week about the stew that he cooks. But then we see uh, Isaac. He comes out the younger. Remember, the older is going to serve the younger. The younger is the elect that God talks about in Malachi and that he talks about in Romans. And he has his heel. And the name, now it just says that he, was, uh, he grabbed Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Well, that's what Jacob meant in the Hebrew. It was a healer. Not a healer like, I'm going to slap you in the head and you're going to be healed. Not that kind of heel. 
a heel as the heel of the foot. And it was somebody that was always snipping away. More literally, it means cheater, deceiver. And Isaac's life is going to bear this out. Then we see the verse right below there. When the boys grow up, Esau is a skilled hunter, a man, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents, dwelling in tents. Excuse me, I've been saying Isaac, but Isaac loved who? He loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. You see two parents that were barren for 20 years and God blesses them with two sons at one time and they have partiality. That's sinful, folks. As someone who just was blessed with, the, with another grandchild this week, I don't know if you've heard or not, but I've told everybody to drive through one than everybody else, so I'm surprised you haven't heard. But we were blessed with a perfectly healthy new granddaughter in Birmingham, Alabama this week, Margaret Paisley Campisi. She's number eight. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away of God's blessing of that, of a man that, that deserves absolutely none of those blessings. And there are eight healthy grandchildren in our family. And I look at that and you say, oh, well, she's the baby. No. I love them all. Now, I might have, as they continue to grow up, I might have more in common with some than I do others. I can already tell you a couple of them are smarter than me right now. So I'm, they're going to be out of my league. But I love them equally as I did my children. The sin of partiality here, it, that's a sin. The same thing of Jacob and, and what we're going to see of him. The imperfections of the people God chooses to show his glory. Because... It is an unconditional. It's not because Jacob was a good guy or Isaac or Abraham or you or me. It is simply God's grace and mercy that he saves us. Is that not a glorious truth, folks? It just goes to why we glorify and exalt God. I can't help but it takes me to Romans 11 because Paul writes this in his letter to Romans. It is the doctrine of salvation that he writes to the church of Rome. If you want to understand your salvation, spend a few years reading Romans. And it will begin to make a little better sense in you. I'm still trying to figure mine out. Because it is a deep book with deep truths in it. That it is a gift of God and not of works. And we say that kind of casually, but that's a big deal. And Paul explains that. But at the end of those three chapters, he talks about the role of Israel and God's relationship with Israel and all of that. And at the end of all of that, of chapter 11, beginning with verse 33, he goes into that, he breaks into that doxology as he's writing this. If you don't believe it's inspired by God, it has to be because it's just so wonderfully written. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable are his ways. And then he quotes from Isaiah and Job. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him is all the glory forever. Amen. What a beautiful way to end when Paul spends all those that time explaining salvation. And then he breaks out, folks, we aren't God, but isn't he a great God? And all glory is due him. And when we hesitate about, about we don't understand God, with all love and compassion to you and to me, I would tell us to dig in. To dig in more and know God better than we know anybody else on the face of the earth to know Him better. And we do that through those ordinary means of His Word and prayer day and night. That's how we do it. There's no, there's no big event coming. There's no big wow that's going to make it happen automatically. It's going to be getting in God's Word and praying to Him.
and fellowshipping with other believers and getting in a small group or one-to-one with another believer and saying, okay, what, what does God's word say about this? That's how we grow in Christ. That's how we know the one who we can't even understand all his knowledge. That's the Holy One of Israel. That's how we know him. And to me, that's a comfort because guess what? I've got God's word. <laughs> I've got his full revelation right here. I got another copy back in my study if you want one. There's one in every pew here. Take it if you don't have one. Because that's how we know the God of the universe. What a blessing he is for us. Pray with me. Holy and mighty God, we stand before you humbled by your greatness. Lord, you have your universe is so vast that the things that you have created are so vast. We, we don't even know of them all. Not to mention that you chose to create man in your image so that you might enjoy fellowship with us and that we might show your glory to the whole earth. And then God, when we chose to rebel, you chose, even before we rebelled, you chose to save us. To save a people, to make your own. Even in our sinfulness, even in all our sin, and all our ugliness, you chose to love us so that your glory might be revealed. Lord, you are indeed a great God. We have sung about that this morning. We have prayed about that. God, we pray that you've been glorified in that. And we pray that as we exit this place today, Lord, that you will be glorified in our understanding of your greatness and your goodness. And we pray this in the everlasting